Oh, don't go yet, Kenneth, darling. Oh, I must, dearest Persephone. Hmm? My... <laughs> Would you believe Percy phone? <laughs> My public needs me. But darling, darling, I need you. I tell you, I need you. But I can't do it without... It would be simply foolish. <laughs> darling, it'll only take a moment. Oh, well, if you insist, darling, but I must warn you, it's going to be jolly difficult mending that flat tire on your bike without a puncture outfit. <laughs> Welcome to the Ken Dodd Family Hour! An hour? Well, it'll seem like an hour. <laughs> the family is a tightly knit entity. And here he is, the tightest knit of them all, making his entity through the Dority over Vetity, Ken Doddity the Oddity! Thank you! Thank you! Thank you! This is a family show. All over the country now, hundreds of families are tuning into this show and saying, if only that flipping telly hadn't blown a valve. <laughs> my, now, my granddad, my little granddad, my, my granddad, he lives with us, my granddad, he was, once, he was a colonel in the British Army. In fact, he's the only living survivor of the Crimea War. One of the nicest, he comes round once a week, just for half an hour, and he goes back to sleep. <laughs> then there's my cousin Basil, actually. He's the first one to have one of those sex change operations. He... After the operation, he went round and said, what's a new one on me? <laughs> We've all got families and we love, we love, we love each other's family. Talfrin, Talfrin, Talfrin Thomas, he bought his mother-in-law a new bonnet last Easter. Got enough an old Bentley. It was a lovely fit. <laughs> hey, well, tell me now then, Ken. What sort of childhood did you really have? Well, you know, Tom, we, we were poor. We were, poor. We were very poor. But, but we were happy, you know, we were well, happy. Well, yes, but were you really poor? Oh, yes, but happy with it. I, I knew what poverty was. You know, we were so poor that my poor old dad couldn't afford tobacco. He used to use dried tea leaves instead. Good we grief. Happy. That must have made a pong when he smoked it. Oh, he didn't smoke it, he used to chew it. <laughs> we were happy. That's the, were you happy? Oh, gosh, can you delirious, man? We were... <laughs> Down in the valleys, man. We were poor too, man. I had to sleep in a bed with 26 in our house. 26? All brothers and sisters? Oh, of course not, man. Just me, the vicar, and the Abba of any male voice choir. But we were happy. <laughs> oh, well, we were poorer than that. We were so poor. We were so poor, we had to share my granddad's trousers between five of us. And what made it worse, my granddad was still inside him when we wore it. <laughs> oh, we were happy. We were well, happy. We were so poor that my mother couldn't even afford the time to sing us to sleep with a lullaby. Yeah? No, she used to leave all the gas taps turned on instead. No! <laughs> <laughs> happy! Were you happy? Uh, we were you happy, Pop? Very happy, yeah. yes, yes, yes. We were so poor that to save on bus fares, yeah. I used to walk 15 miles to school and back every day. And at the end of the week, I'd have threepence to spend. Ah. What, what did you spend it on, Pop? Foot ointment and corn plasters. <laughs> <laughs> but I was happy. I was happy. That's what I was. Everything we had was worn. Everything we had was worn in our house. We were the only family in the street who had a tomcat with holes in it. <laughs> we, we were happy. That's the point. We were, we were so poor, I only got one penny a week to spend, one good dose of castor oil, and that was my pocket money gone for a burden. <laughs> were you happy, though? Oh, very. Delicious. And relieved. <laughs> oh, no, we were so poor that we couldn't afford a proper holiday. No? Oh, I had to shoot me mum and dad so I could get on an orphan's outing. But I was very, very happy. <laughs> You're poor, you're poor, you see, this is what you learn, you're poor but happy. We, we were so poor, we were so poor, I always had to wear the same old clothes year in and year out. I was the only lad in the sixth form with nappy rash. <laughs> but we were happy, weren't we? we were we, Echoes on? <laughs> What 
What is a mother-in-law? A mother-in-law is someone who calls on you at Easter and brings a Christmas tree with her in case you should ask her to stay for a few days. <laughs> a mother-in-law is actually three separate beings. To a husband, she's a wife. To a daughter, she's a mother. And to a son-in-law, she's a pain in the neck. <laughs> Mother-in-laws come in four sizes. Big, bigger, bigger than that, and are you sure that's a blue whale, Charlie? <laughs> The mother-in-law is one of the two most harmless creatures on God's earth. The other is a black mamba. <laughs> Mother-in-laws make exceptionally good insect repellents. I've heard them talking to their son-in-law. There's no flies on me, you know. <laughs> Tears stream from the eyes of all mother-in-laws at their daughter's wedding. This is usually because they've got their size six feet in a pair of size four shoes. But of one thing you can be sure, if you ever do manage to rid yourself of your mother-in-law, that vision in lurex, red flannel and whalebone, it'll only be temporary, because your wife will be the spitting image of her 20 years from now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we present the Ken Dodd Theatre of Romance. And this week, over to Elstree Studios, where the greatest of the great family movies is being made. Right, places, everybody. I'm the producer. Right, places. Come on, loves. Stand by to come in when I clap my hands, the celestial choir. OK, loves. Action. Romeo. Cut. Look. <laughs> look, put a bit more feeling in it, will you, dear? Stand, stand, stand by. Stand by the celestial choir to come in when I clap my hands. Action. Romeo. Cut. Look, look, sweetie, sweetie, it's Romeo. More lyrical. Romeo. <laughs> no, sweetie. Romeo. Yes, that's better. Right, stand by the celestial choir. OK, loves, come in when I clap my hands. Action. Romeo. What in the club? It. Would you believe it, folks? Here is our educational bit. Hello, Master Shakespeare here. Did you know that a fully trained secretary can type 300 words a minute with one hand tied behind her back? And she can type 500 words a minute if the boss has both hands tied behind his back. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know? that it's possible to get off with doing away with the old missus by lifting a grid and shoving a head first into a drain. Aye, right. you can plead insanitary. <laughs> Here it is, folks. Exchange and part. Get rid of your old unwanted articles and send them to us. Wanted, urgently, curry cot and pram in exchange for loose-fitting wedding dress with slight bulge in front. <laughs> For sale, genuine Ming vase and tea service, five thousand pounds. Contact Fred Ming, three the potteries, Stock and Trent. <laughs> Pools punters, try my amazing foolproof Wonder X plan, guaranteed to give you draws galore and make your fortune on the football pools. Send a five-pound postal order right away to Horace Spinster, care of Cubicle 2, the Salvation Army Men's Hostel, Canesham, near Wigan. That's Canesham, W-I-G-A-N. <laughs> I buy all old Nazi war insignia, medals and uniforms. Send them now for immediate cash offer to A. Hitler, Ray Bento Street, Argentine. Today, souvenirs. Tomorrow, survive! For sale, folks, for sale. Kiddies go-kart with reclining seats would suit mature six-year-old. For <laughs> sale. Genuine mauve patent leather gent off-the-shoulder handbag. A free course in Kung Fu is given with everyone bored. For sale, 
Genuine Victorian whatnot. Apply, who's it? Think of a jig, where'd you call it? <laughs> Send an Irish father with a reply. <laughs> Now the sun's going down at the end of the day It's a lonely old town, you're a thousand miles away Here I sit all alone, picturing your smile Till the day you come home, darling, once in a while Think of me, wherever you are Wherever you are, I'm thinking of you And my love will shine Like the bright evening star That is shining on you Wherever you are Now the moon's in the sky And I'm missing you so Time slowly goes by As the days come and go Till you're home once again, this is all I can say, darling, just now and then, at the end of each day. Think of me, wherever you are, wherever you are, I'm longing to be every night. I know, no matter how far, that wherever you are, So good night and God bless wherever you may be. The moon that you see is shining on me. We may be wells apart, but the love we knew then will be safe in my heart till you need it again. Think of me. My love will shine like the bright evening star that is shining on you wherever you are. Think of me. Think of me. And now, over to that ancient seat of learning, Naughty Ash University, where that wackademic pedagogue, Professor Rufus Chakabati, is in the middle of a very important tutorial session with his students. Well, as I was, uh, <clears throat> as I was saying, students, marriage customs differ greatly all over the world. For instance, in the Maasai tribe, the groom picks up his beautiful seven-foot-five tall, 25-stone bride, lifts her slowly three times above his head, and utters the immortal words, Quick, start a trust fund! <laughs> Throughout history, yep. which has proved the most useful invention for the family? Good question. Now, some people would say the most useful invention was fire. Others say it was the wheel, and some say electricity. But they're all wrong. What was it? It's the self-detonating, exploding rissole. It blows itself up. It blows itself up if you don't eat it within three days. And then, of course, there are nuclear jockey trunks. They're very dodgy, though. Why is that? Well, there's a high risk of fallout. And... <laughs> Now then, students, <clears throat> now then, students, I have thought, I have thought of a scheme that will revolutionize family eating habits. It does away with plates, does away with dishes, knives and forks, tables and chairs, and all the family can eat together. Well, what is it? It's a pig trough. <laughs> <laughs> what other things have you invented then? Well, it's my patent atomic radishes. You don't burp after eating those. Why? What happens? World War Three. <laughs> I say, Chucky Love. Mm. I say. <laughs> Talking to you, Tuff. I say, I say, li no, listen a minute, listen, listen. Yeah. I've got one for you. Not for Do me, you... I haven't. <laughs> now stop it, it'll end in tears. <laughs> Do you think 
it would be advisable for me to buy a cottage suite? I'm sure it would, sugar. <laughs> Ah, yes, here he is. Now then, Professor, what is your advice about water beds? Water beds? Have a damp course put in before you start. <laughs> so that's it, students. Next week, I'll be telling you how to feed a family of five on 30p a week. Right! It's not as long as they're a family of budgies, it's not. Who's a clever boy, then? Who's a clever boy? Have you ever been to the corner shop? Minding your own business and stocking up with the week's groceries when along comes interfering Winnie, the nosy neighbour from across the road. Ah, now then. Now then, let me see what I need. Uh, oh, that bacon looks rather tasty. Oh, get me some couple of rushes of that. Hello, young Mr. Dalt. Are you doing your shopping? Oh, hello, Winnie. No, I'm having all my teeth out. <laughs> you will have your little joke <laughs> one day. <laughs> oh. I know. I'll, I'll have a quarter of those little button mushrooms. They look nice and tasty. Well, I wouldn't like to put you off. No, no I'm sure you wouldn't. But our Willie had some of them the other day and yeah? he's had to wear a kilt ever since. A kilt? <laughs> I know I shouldn't ask this. <laughs> but why should little Willie have to wear a kilt after eating mushrooms? Because his legs swelled up like balloons and he couldn't get his trousers on. Oh, <laughs> Oh, in that case, I think, I'll, I think I'll have a tin of cocky leaky soup. The name puts me off. Yes, perhaps you're right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll just have a couple of those sweet sticky buns. You know, the one with those little crunchy currants on the top. Oh, do you mean the one that's been standing under the fly paper? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll have to have something for my tea. Oh, I'll take one of those big pork pies. They look all right. Oh, I wouldn't do that. Why not? Oh, I found an earring in one of them the other week. What's wrong with that? Accidents happen. It was still a time. All right, all right, yes. <laughs> I've had enough of you poking your nose into my business. And another thing, if there's so much if there's so much wrong with the food in here, how comes your basket is full to the top and mine's still empty? Because I want to get through the checkout counter before you do. I can't stand here gassing all day. Oh, you cheeky old faggot! <laughs> Hey, how about your family, Ken? I suppose the dogs were typical northerners, eh? How do you mean? Well, you know, your boys like. Hey. <laughs> how do you know? Our family's full of swells. My granddad's given them all the mumps. Oh, Ken Dodd, what a whopper! Well, that's what happens when you get the mumps, you see. Uh, <laughs> oh, come on, <laughs> Now, we believe in the old family values. Only the other night, we were, we were all gathered around the piano singing knick-knack paddywhack and eating mushy peas with our fingers and... We were really, you know, we were happy. That's the thing. <laughs> Till the police came round and shifted us out of the music shop window. Not rubbish at all. No, he said, I've been living a lie. Ken Dodd, actually, and this is going to startle him. This will probably make everybody rise to their the feet here. Ken Dodd isn't my real name. Get away, you joke, You see, my real name is... Well? well? Leonard Legover. Why you kept it quiet? Wait, no, no, just, just one. One moment, one moment. You're not the Leonard Legover. The Leonard Legover. The missing heir. You've been peeping. <laughs> what to the Legover millions oh, are you? <laughs> the very same. <gasps> so you are the missing heir. You keep telling everybody. But exactly why have you had to change your identity? Why? Because, because, because they're they're after me. The Lego over lot. They, they, they want to do away with me and, and grab my wherewithal. Ooh. <laughs> see, I was always my granddad Legover's favourite. And one day he called me in his study and he told me he wanted me for his heir. So I climbed on his shoulders and wrapped myself around his little baldy head. <laughs> I'll always remember the words he spoke to me that day. Listen here, me little sugar butty. Watch mine's thine from henceforth. And they mustn't let that thieving lot get their maulers on the inheritance. Just hear me. I was astounded. I'd never heard him talk like that before. After all, he was a Cambridge undergraduate. <laughs> <laughs> he told me that a condition of me being made his heir, I had to learn every facet of the Legover show business empire. So I took jobs in every branch. All the time, they were all trying to see me off, you know. First of all, there was the daredevil burbacked Legovers. Ooh, and what did they do that was clean and I legal? I thought you'd ask that. <laughs> <laughs> they were a unique circus act. They rode donkeys burbacked and did triple somersaults on the trapeze. 
Now then, Leonard Lance, you know the score. You've had ten minutes practice, so get up on the donkey and let's see what you can do. Yes, yes, Uncle Leopold. <laughs> Rub your hands on the resin bag, grip the junkie between your knees, and swing on the trapeze to the other side. Are you sure? Yes, sure, I'm sure. Oh, well, here goes then. G up, Neddy. Missed. My hands had slipped. They slipped because the cunning old devil had substituted the resin bag for half a pound of dripping. But as luck would have it, the donkey broke my fall, and Uncle Leopold broke the donkey's fall. And we buried him next day in six inches of sawdust. <laughs> next, I was sent to serve me time to the great Legaro Barini, the world's finest escapologist. So, now let me see. What have we here? Yes, it's me. Master oh. Leonard. Yes. Oh, yes. You wish to be an escapologist, yeah? Uh, yeah yes, please, yes, Uncle Legaro Barini. Please call me Ethel. <laughs> <laughs> Very well, we shall give you a chance to show your metal. First... I'm glad I, <laughs> I'm glad I brought me Brasso. <laughs> Carry on until I get over any. Good, I'm glad you've got polish. <laughs> First... no, that's just I've got a guilt complex. <laughs> Carry on until I get over any. Very well, now first yep. I will tie you up. So, ah, there now, is that tight enough? Uh, yes, <laughs> but shouldn't the rope be around my wrist instead of my neck? <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. Now, can you please, all right? Okay, I was like... <laughs> <laughs> it's good, good. Now, we shall nail you into this airtight metal coffin. <laughs> and now... We shall throw you into the river! Oh, I like it! I like it! So! Ah, goodbye, young Master Leonard! Give my regards to Houdini! <laughs> Is this curtains for Noddy? Oh, it's a frock I'm making for myself. <laughs> But above all, will Ken thou art be here next week? <laughs> of course I will! I need the flipping money! Hey! Happy bye, everybody! Happy bye! <laughs> you have been listening to a program on family planning starring Ken Dodd. If you've anyone like him and your family, well, I should start planning to leave the country right away. Kenneth Arthur, relatively speaking, were his Dutch uncle, Talvin Van Thomas, and his aunt's sisters, Joe Manning Wilson and William Margulies. On the other side of the blanket were Michael McLean and Chris Emmett. The script, devised by Ken Dodd, was crayoned by Dave Dutton, Terry Ravenscroft, Morris Bird, Philip and Mike Brennan, and was produced by the granddaddy of them all, Bobby Jay! Yeah!